Now, here's another thing I really want to bring you because this is really very important. When, I just mentioned this, when Jesus told the disciples to wait and they received their power. Now, I really, a point I really want to bring here and I want everybody to catch this point because this point is very, very important. Including Peter among the 120 who received the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'll mark you, Peter had denied Jesus Christ. Not one time, not two times, but three times. He did even swear. He did even curse. I don't know what you are talking about. I mean, can you imagine somebody you love, you call a friend, maybe a sibling, maybe a relative. They say, do you know so and so? He said, no. I don't even know what you are talking about. I have never met that man in my life. <laughs> that is what precisely Peter said. But guess what? When the, after the resurrection, when the resurrection took place, Jesus comes down. And guess what? One of the first people he met was Peter. Wow. A person who denied him. I want to show you the picture of God's love, of God's forgiveness. He has forgiven us. Yeah. Now, here's a story which I wanted to portray to you. I really believe with all my heart that Judas, if he had waited, Judas if he had not gone and hanged himself on the cross, Judas, if he had stayed, Jesus was going to forgive him. That's powerful. Yeah. Because all others who fall short, Jesus forgave them. He did not forgive them only, but actually he qualified them to be God's ambassadors to be Jesus' ambassadors. Man, that is powerful. Not because of their goodness. This is the thing we need to get over and over and over. Peter was not good. Peter denied Jesus. Peter had a big mouth. But guess what? God loved him as much as he had a big mouth. I mean, Peter would open his mouth and it would just run, 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 run. <laughs> There's things he did or talked about he had no clue. Me? I'm not going to deny you. Maybe, maybe, maybe these other 11, but not me. I'm not going to do it. Guess what? He ate his own words. But guess what? Jesus forgave him like it never, never, never happened. <laughs> It like it never happened. And he said, you know what? On you, Peter, I'm going to build my church. You're going to be the foundation of everything. And by the way, when we talk about Peter, we're not talking about the Pope. Sometimes we get that picture. Okay? We are talking about Peter. Amen? And this is a powerful, powerful picture. Yes. A powerful picture of God's love. A powerful picture of God's forgiveness. Now Judas, if he had waited, Judas would have been forgiven. Yes. Judas would be in heaven. Seriously. But he overreacted. Like most of us. He felt he was no good. He did not even deserve the salvation. He did not deserve to be a follower after all he had done. My friend, I don't know what you have done. Maybe you have killed people and you haven't been arrested or nobody has found out that you killed somebody. That is not an issue now. I want you to come to Jesus. He's going to forgive you and he's going to say, you know what? I will remember no more. That's a powerful. Hebrews chapter 8. 
I will remember no more of your sins. That is what Jesus would have done to Judas. He would have told him, I'll remember no more of your sins. He did this with a thief on the cross. He was bad. But the thief said, remember me. Remember me, Lord. And said, you will be with me tonight. Wow. <laughs> you will be with me. He forgave the thief because he repented. What does the word repent mean? He turned his mind. He tried a change of thought. And he said, Lord Jesus, I want to be with you. This is powerful. And this is what we need to know. That God is love. He does not love you because you are good. He does not love you because of your past. It doesn't matter whether your past was good or it was evil. It doesn't matter. If you can come to him, he will forgive you. Like nothing, nothing happened. And then, listen to this. He will give you his Holy Spirit to lead you, to direct you, and to guide you. Well, that will be exciting. That will be exciting. That will be the most exciting thing. He will lead you and direct you. This is what it's all about when Paul, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, he said, the fruit of the Spirit, he gives nine of them. Guess what? The first one is love. Wow. Wow. When you are led by the Spirit, not by the works, not by the flesh, but when you are led by the Spirit, what happens? The fruits of the Spirit will be coming out of you. Woo! I wish money would get this revelation to walk in the Spirit, to allow the Spirit of God to lead you. You're going to have joy. You're going to have goodness in you. You're going to have, you'll be a gentleman. You're going to have peace. Wow. All that comes from the Spirit of God. When you are a born again, filled with grace, filled with God's grace, you, are, you will be empowered. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about the power of grace. This is another problem with a lot of people. They don't understand the problem. And unfortunately, there are so many lies today. Even the church from the pulpit with the microphone, people are being told, holy, you have to be holy, holy, holy. They, they, they make holy like it's supposed to be up here. No, holy is not up here. Righteousness is up here. Yeah. You can't be holy without being righteous. It is impossible. Again, this idea, you got to be holy. It's, 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 the, it's the work of the flesh. I got to make myself holy. Really? Where are you going to get the power? You are not your own savior. If you want to be holy, you need to come to Jesus. Abandon your ship. I like that. Abandon your sheep and they jump to the sheep of Jesus Christ. Because that's where there is holiness. Once you receive holiness, mm, please get this. Once you receive holiness, automatically you have holiness. Let me say that. Once you receive righteousness, you have holiness. Because the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 verse 17, as he is, so are you. As he is, so are you. First of all, how do you get Jesus to be part of you? By believing and asking him to come into your heart. That's all you do. 
And then when you become like him, now Jesus is holy, so you become holy too. Man, that's powerful. I know the, the things I'm talking about, you got to get this. They don't make sense. Okay? They don't make sense logically. The things of God are not logical. They are divine. They are inspired by the Spirit of God. Because most of us, at least 80-90%, we operate from sense knowledge. From head knowledge. That's why I'm trying to get you away from your head knowledge. From your little head and go to the mind of God. That's where there is a big picture. That's where there are big things in God. Yeah, in God. We need to get this and understand this and get this type of revelation. Because if we don't, we cannot be able to have abundance. Mark that word, abundance of grace. Romans 5.17 abundance much more much more much grace oh my god you cannot exhaust exhaust what god has for you you can you have an access to god's property you have an access to god's kingdom when you believe when you become a believer you become a co-owner. Mm. A co-owner. No more poverty. That's how exciting it is. No more poverty because there is a lot of gold. Hallelujah. There is a lot of silver. There is there, there, there are a lot of houses in the kingdom of God. There is a lot. Much, much more. Abundance. Abundance. There is no lacking in the kingdom of God. I wish you see my heart. There is no, there is no, there is no lack. No, there is no lack. Seriously, there is no lack in the kingdom of God. All you need is to believe. And once you believe, man, this is really exciting. You have abundance. In his kingdom. You have plenty. Yeah. I know still some of you are going to say. You know what. Yeah, I don't deserve it. Well that's not the issue. It's not about you deserve it. Everything we get from God. We don't deserve it. That's, where I talk, that's why I love to talk about the grace. Because the grace will make you. And tell you. You don't deserve what you have. Some of you, you got nice vehicles, you got nice homes, you got some money on the account. You don't deserve that. You have some children, you don't deserve that. You have some nice parents, you don't deserve that. But God, God's grace made it possible to you. Some of you have got spouses. You don't deserve a good wife. Seriously, you don't have a, you don't deserve a good husband. I know some of you say, yeah, man, yeah, yeah, I, I was good. No, you are a favored. That's simple. You are a what? Favored. Now, what am I saying? You want to get this favor of God. Please get this word. Submit to God. Yeah, this is deep. Submit to God. Stop fighting God. Stop resisting God. Just say, Lord, I believe. This is a powerful statement. When you submit, you receive favor. I'm going to say that three times because it's powerful. When you submit to God, you receive favor. Powerful. I know, especially you ladies, when the, the, the Bible says, submit to your husband, you make it look like a, a bad, evil thing. No, God tells you to submit to your husbands because he loves you. Because once you submit to your husbands, you know what's going to happen? 
you're going to find a favor with God. Yeah, that's powerful. If you think you are stubborn, if you think you are smart, and you don't want to submit to your husband, you know what? You might as well forget the favor of God. I'm trying you to get the picture. When you submit to your husband, you are, the Bible says, do it as you do it unto the Lord. Oh, that's good. When you submit to your husband, you are actually submitting to God. Your first man in your life is Jesus Christ. So you are submitting to Jesus. And once you submit to Jesus, Jesus will know how to deal with your man. I'm talking about the man who is stubborn. I'm talking about the man who is a, a pain. Yeah. He will deal with your man. But you have to submit to Jesus. You submit to your man as you submit unto the Lord. You need to get this picture. This is big. This is big. And it is going to take you to another level. A higher level. Especially in America. Me submitting to you. Who are you? No, no, no. I will submit. I will submit. Yeah. I will submit. Not because you are good. I will submit. There are ministers I submit to. They are my spiritual role models I submit to. I submit to them as unto the Lord. There are things I will submit to my wife. The Bible says submit one to another. Yeah. That doesn't come natural to me to submit to my wife. But I will do, I will do, I will do it because that is the will of my father. I don't want to miss favor. Yeah, once you submit, let me tell you, <laughs> this is really hard. There was a, ma a woman in the Bible, and her name was uh, Ruth. Ruth, she lost her first husband. Ruth, she was a widow. Ruth, she was raised in a well-to-do family. Everything was going very, very well for Ruth, okay? And uh, until this man, who was not a Moabite, showed up and told her, don't worship idols. There is a true God. And she got the message. And that was like a, <laughs> a cardinal sin to her family. They started actually persecuting her. Actually, they, they, they sought to kill her, to arrest her. And eventually she was even able to escape. Yeah, she escaped with her mother-in-law by the name Naomi. And eventually she went with Naomi where Naomi came from, which was Bethlehem, and where she was Jewish. And there she was again persecuted. <laughs> she was persecuted when she went with Naomi. The siblings of Naomi. The family of Naomi, the countrymen of Naomi, didn't say, oh, thank you so much for bringing this beautiful looking woman. And what is her name? Her name is Ruth. No, they didn't receive her. That. They actually accused her of committing adultery, which she didn't do. And the people are going to choose you. But here's the good news. The truth will always set you free. Yeah. The truth will always set you free. That's exciting. And eventually, the truth set her free. And then there was another guy who wanted to marry her. And she said, you know what? I don't love, I don't, I don't love that guy. I only love Boaz. And God made the desire. But here's a point I want to make. Ruth requested, told, sorry, Naomi requested, told Ruth to go to Boaz and be there with him. You know, a woman don't really doesn't come very hard. It just, it's not a natural thing for a, a woman to go to a man. You know? Most men don't like women who come to them. 
Men, naturally, they like to hunt. Yeah, we like to hunt. That's our nature. We like to hunt. <laughs> I, I, I like to have the remote control at my residence, you know. Really, my wife holds the, re the remote control. <laughs> because if, uh, if she has the remote control, it's like I'm losing. I'm not hunting anymore. It's, it's, it's the truth. So I got to have that remote control. I feel, I feel good when I have the remote control. I just feel I'm in charge. I just feel I am going to hunt and I know the right program, what we should watch. That's the way I feel. That's how men are. But even that, we need to submit. Because when we submit, that's where we find favor. Ruth had to submit. He didn't come easy for But guess what? She went to Boaz. And the Boaz, when he woke up, he found the woman seated by her feet. He said, who is this woman? <laughs> And uh, to make the long story short, Ruth got married to Boaz. Okay? And the Boaz and Ruth, they had a son. His name was Obed. And Obed had a son. His name was Jesse. And Jesse had a son whose name was David. David eventually became the king. And in the line of David, there came Jesus. Now, man, this is why I told you. You find a favor. When I teach about favor, I like to mention about Ruth. Because Ruth is a great example of favor. She got what she didn't deserve. She was a widow. She was in a foreign country. There are a lot of foreign people in the United States. I used to live in Seattle. There was a region there. At least 23 people in that community, they were foreign born. So if you are foreign born, yeah. Have peace. God will bless you. Don't feel, oh, this is not in my country. I was not born here. No. You are here now. God is going to bless you. Ruth was in a foreign country. God blessed her. And even you Caucasian people, your great, great parents, this was not their land. They came here. Yeah. They were not the original people of the United States. Seriously. The original people who lived here in the United States, they were Indians. So anybody who is white, they migrated here. I know you feel like uh, you really, you are the origin of this country. That's not true. It's just the grace of God you are here. That simple. It's the grace of God your great fathers, they are known as the founding fathers who came from Britain originally. And then they went to Holland, where they were persecuted. They were, they were looking for freedom of worship. They started publishing the, the Bibles in Holland, and they came and confiscated the factory where they were printing Bibles. And then they had to go back to Britain. I mean, they were being persecuted. One time they left Britain separately. The men took different boats and the women took different boats. I'm talking your forefathers in the United States. The founding fathers. And then the women were arrested. Can you imagine what they went through to come to this country? They are not the original of this country. Yeah. Seriously. They are indigenous. They came here. They migrated here. Your great, 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 great. So don't try to claim America. This is God's land. It belongs to his people. God created America for his people. That simple. I know when we get in the flesh, 
we start doing crazy thoughts. We start saying, you know, somebody discovered America. No, they were people here. Somebody discovered Africa. No, they were in, there were people in Africa. Don't say we discovered. There were people there. God had the people there, originally from there. Actually, it has been discovered that uh, the oldest man in the world has been found in Africa. Yeah. So, talking about uh, civilization began in Africa. It began in Egypt. There was one time in Egypt, they, they, they created a ship to go across the ocean. And today we have the best science. They can't even do that. With the latest technology, they can't do that. But these people did it. And they say, you discovered them? You discovered them? God put them there. They had the brain. Yeah. Because... You went there and they saw them for the first time. It doesn't mean you, dis you discovered them or you owned them. God put them there. Because it's simply because you are ignorant. You didn't know they are there. I mean, it's like you turn your ignorance and say, guess what? I am really sharp. <laughs> no, you didn't know they were there. They were there. That's the truth. Like most of us today, there are things we don't know about the Bible, and I've been studying the Bible for the last 30 uh, years. Yes, actually 40 years when you get to look at it, when, from the day I became a Christian. And I'm still a student, I don't know it, but every day I find new truth. Every day I find new knowledge. Every day I'm growing. Because there is so much hidden in the word of God. Every time I study the word of God, there is unveiling of Jesus Christ. In, G in the book of Genesis, unveiling of Jesus. Every book of the Bible, there is Jesus. Every page of the Bible, there is Jesus. Powerful. But you to say, well, you don't see how Jesus is in the book of Genesis or you don't see how in every page is there. Well, you are just ignorant. All of us, we don't have it together. Ignorance is the biggest enemy for mankind. I don't know everything. I would be the first one to tell you. But I'm determined. I'm really determined. When I came to America, I said, well, right now, I'm not going to study to be uh, a lawyer or these other prestigious careers. I could have gone to school. But you know what I chose? I chose to study theology. To me, I wanted to know anything there is about God. And I was so glad. <laughs> I remember when I was going to college. In this college, they offered uh, um, a course to study Greek. And they said, if I studied Greek, I'd really know the, the Greek and Hebrew, the closest words, because that's, those were the, the words that they used. I said, sign me up. Because I wanted to know, really. Yeah, I can find a Greek word, and I studied the alphabet, and, and figure out the real, real truth. And it has helped me. Because I can, as I study Greek, I can know that they translated this Bible, but they translated, they left one word out. Yeah. Like in Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, instead they said full of the Holy Ghost, they should say full of grace. Because that's the original Greek word, it says grace. So that helps me. Why am I sharing these things with you? Because the more you seek God, the more you will be able to find out. The more you knock on the door, the more the door will be opened. And when the door is open, you look inside and say, oh my God, oh my God, look at this beauty. Look at this treasure. You see, most of us, we like 
to look into these celebrities' homes. Oprah, the other day I showed the show, her house, wow. Inside, wow. She's a billionaire. Yeah. There is another house in Seattle. Bill Gates. You go in just a tour and see, this is a one of the richest men in the world. You go inside the house, you say, wow, look at this house. And it's a great feeling, say, my good Lord. And sometimes it's just a dream. You look at the house, and you say, wow, wow, you know, wow. You look at these houses. But let me tell you, it is the same idea when you knock on God's door. It's going to open for you. You can see inside heaven. Woo! Woo! You can see inside the kingdom of God. Woo! Gold is there. Mansions are there. No diseases. The house of God which is the kingdom of God, which is called heaven, it doesn't come close to any celebrity's house. It doesn't. And that's why I'm encouraging you to look and knock into God's house. 